Hi, I'm Earl Taylor, Chief Knowledge Officer at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, MSI helps marketers become better marketers. Our business and academic thought leaders collaborate to create new marketing knowledge, which we share in a variety of ways. One of the most popular is our lunch lecture series. Those of you attending today represent many business sectors such as healthcare, food and beverage, financial services, and CPG, as well as MSI members such as AbbVie, Colgate, T. Rowe Price, AT, AT&T, and more. And we're delighted to welcome you to learn more about using habitual behavior in your marketing. Now, before we begin, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have during the presentation. We'll gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. Now, I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Jesse Itzkowitz has been studying how consumers make decisions for over 15 years. He has PhDs in marketing and cognitive psychology. Prior to joining Ipsos, Dr. Itzkowitz was a marketing professor at the Sims School of Business at Yeshiva University. He has won a number of uh, research and teaching awards, including the 2013 and 2017 Yeshiva University Professor of the Year Award, and he has been named an AMA Chef Foundation Fellow. Jesse specializes in behavioral decision making, including how consumers' decisions are driven by hidden non-conscious factors. His work has been highlighted in the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, Bloomberg Business Week, and CNN, and he has been featured in a number of academic journals. His work has been published there. He's also presented at numerous conferences, including Financial Management Association, the Association for Consumer Research, and the Society for Consumer Psychology. So with that, we're very pleased to welcome Jesse to share with us uh, his ideas about triggering behavioral change, how to make and break consumer habits. Jesse? Thank you very much, Earl, for the very nice introduction. Uh, as Earl mentioned, I come from academia, uh, but I've been with Ipsos for almost two years now as part of our Behavioral Science Center. And our Behavioral Science Center, we service all of the clients that Ipsos works with, from CPG to healthcare to finance and technology, uh, even going all the way down to kind of customer experience and employee engagement. And during this time, I've been able to work on a lot of really cool projects where we've applied behavioral science to help us address our clients' business and marketing challenges. And these have ranged from creating new segmentation tools, looking at brand renovation and innovation, and also helping them just improve their communications. And today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the work that I've been the most excited about, which is really around the area of behavioral change and how to create or break habits. So understanding habits can help you in a bunch of different ways. And I think kind of you know, the first and most basic way is that a general understanding of what makes consumption and usage of your product automatic will also help you gain a grasp of what the key conscious and non-conscious factors are around adoption and product usage uh, or the lack thereof. Uh, and these can be used to inform product design, communications efforts, and consumer targeting. Uh, but I think the way that most people typically look at habits is around the second application, and it's much more common in terms of the requests that we get. And this is how do I make use of sticky? There are some people that are using my product right now. How do I get them to use more, more often, for a longer period of time? And here, being able to create behaviors that can be turned on almost automatically has huge impact for a business, uh, even if the actual change required by an individual consumer would be relatively small. So you know, I think one of the greatest things about habits is that once you've gained insight into what drives usage and continued usage and automatic usage uh, for your consumers, you can activate against this information in several different ways. And at Ipsos, I've helped companies use this framework to help them create new rubrics for media planning, help them create new communications briefs. Uh, we've worked with companies on making changes or recommendations to their package or their product. And we've even looked at how to kind of drive this store automatically uh, using some cues there as well. And so today, we'll cover four areas which are really critical that can help you understand you know, how to use this in your own work. And so today we'll talk about what habits are. Uh, we'll cover some best practices for creating strong habits. 
And then we'll look at when consumers are receptive to both make and break habits, those moments of behavioral change. And finally, we'll end with some considerations for you as you begin your journey to understand your consumers' habits uh, in a way that's going to be actionable. So we'll just start off by first understanding kind of the how and what, of how, what habits are. So one of the most fundamental aspects of behavioral science is an understanding that our thoughts and our behaviors are not always the results of conscious deliberation and thought. And decades of research have consistently shown that while we can often act rationally and deliberately, uh, there are other times where we act irrationally or impulsively, or we seem to be acting on our own instincts. And these inconsistencies that we see are really just a function of how our brain works. And at a most basic level, it seems like we have two operating systems within our brain for processing information, system one and system two. And system one is our older evolutionary brain. It's really what's kept us alive as a species since our days on the savanna. Uh, it's a non-conscious pattern recognition machine that operates automatically, non-consciously, efficiently, and quickly. In general, system one is really focused on what's right in front of us right now. What can we see? What can we feel? What can we do? What can we smell? What can we taste? And it uses this immediate information to make a decision. And it's really built for that. It's good at making good enough decisions for the here and now, but not necessarily for the long term. And this is where system two comes in. Our conscious decision making is used, uses this system, uh, which is great when we're not just focused on the here and now, but actually need to maximize our outcome over a longer amount of time, or when we encounter a problem that's novel that we haven't seen before. And system two is thought to reside in the prefrontal cortex, which evolutionarily is really just the newest section of our brain. And the system helps us to plan, to cooperate, and to reason. And it's controlled, it's analytical, it's slow, it's deliberate, and it's conscious. And here, decisions that have long-term impact and no immediate threat can be considered to maximize the long-term impact. And system two is really responsible for helping us learn, helping us think, and helping us kind of work through things that we haven't seen before. And habits are really an interaction between both of these systems, as I'll talk about now. So this is a, a really interesting area. And you know, it's one that academics have looked at for a while. And I, I think one of the kind of leading researchers in this area is uh, Professor Wendy Wood, who's at University of Southern California. And she's done a lot of work around kind of what makes a habit, what breaks a habit, how do these all play out. And one of her studies, I think, really exemplifies how powerful this habitual behavior can be. In this experiment, they took a number of people to the movie theater who were frequent movie theater attendees. And they gave people a bag full of popcorn. And this popcorn was either fresh, it had just been popped, or, or it was a couple days stale. And in a separate task, they asked people, you know, how, how tasty is this popcorn? And not surprisingly, people who got the stale popcorn thought it stunk and, and didn't give it a good rating at all. And the opposite was true for people who got the fresh popcorn. And what was interesting is that they had them watch the movie, and they had the popcorn there, is at the end of the movie, they weighed the bags of popcorn to see how much was eaten. And what they found out was regardless of whether or not these frequent movie theater goers got stale or fresh popcorn, they ate the same exact amount. And what this shows us is this conflict between system one and system two. System two should be saying, you know, full stop, you know, this popcorn is bad, there's no reason to eat it. But system one's pattern recognition is so strong that it senses the movie, the popcorn, and the context of being in the star theater. And it starts to initiate that kind of bag to mouth behavior almost automatically. And this, in essence, is really the story of habit. Our behaviors start off as learned, and then with practice, they become non-conscious. So I imagine that we can all kind of remember if we have a driver's license, you know, when we're first learning how to drive. And we'd have our hands at 10 and 2 on the wheel. We're telling our friends in the back to be quiet or maybe even turning the radio down. So that way we can practice and really learn what it takes in order to make sure that we're driving quickly. Now we get in the car. We turn on NPR. We wake up kind of literally in our driveway. And Ira Glass is concluding his, his talk. And we don't even know how we got there. And what's really happened here is that driving has gone from sort of this conscious learning into something more automatic, where we see the cars moving around us, we have that path home memorized, we're using subtle cues around us to really literally drive ourselves and drive our cars home. You know, walking is another interesting one. I don't know if any of you have younger children. Uh, I have a two and a half year old, and I distinctly remember, you know, when she was learning to walk, and she'd be sort of like shuffling along, and I'd yell out like, hey, Molly. 
and she'd fall down. And, and I know it seems mean, it's okay, it's for science. Um, but you know, the idea here is that, again, you know, this conscious learning is now something that we can all do automatically. And this is true for driving, this is true for walking, this is true for buying shampoo, and this is true for product use as well. So the interesting thing is that you know, many of these behaviors take a long time to happen and require lots and lots of practice and repetition. But there are ways as a marketer that you can isolate which behaviors may have the most potential for turning into a habit. And then you can create an ecosystem all around this behavior to help make them automatic or make them automatic more quickly. So let's look at how we do this. So this is kind of the basic habits framework that we utilize here as it says. And it's, what's interesting about this is when you think about how people learn, uh, it's really not that much different than how animals, like a dog or even a lab rat learn, which is sometimes a bit scary if you really sit down and think about it. Uh, but essentially, there are three main components to any learning or any habit. And so first, there is the cue, which is the external or internal trigger that system one recognizes and then starts to plan actions from. This leads to the behavior or the actual actions that are performed in order to receive a positive reward or sometimes even just avoid a negative reward from occurring. This reward or consequence then causes system one to update its recognition system. And so when we've been rewarded well, our brain strengthens the link between the cue, the behavior, and the reward. And when it's kind of a, a negative consequence to that behavior, it kind of, again, kind of builds up that link to say like, hey, when you see this cue, do not initiate this behavior. This is not what you want to do. So it can also work to kind of prevent us from something happening. So in our prior example, you know, we had the theater, the movie, and the box of popcorn. These are all the cues. These are, you know, the things that are initiating the behavior. Grabbing the popcorn and eating it is the behavior that we're talking about. And then the reward would be the amusement and typically the good and tasty popcorn. Uh, so popcorn was always stale and not good, the behavior would have never become automatic in the first place. So just one more quick example of this. So I've gotten pretty good at not picking up my phone with each notification that I receive, uh, but I always do for some of my favorite people. And so here the cue is the notification. Uh, the behavior is checking the message. And the reward is something that I might enjoy, right? So it's like another BoJack Horseman meme from one of my friends. Or if it's from a work friend, like right before this webinar, it might be something a little bit motivational, uh, like Rosie the Riveter here. So when we think about kind of how to think about creating these habits, uh, we believe it's important to start with the behaviors. And the reason why is that if this is really centered around what the behavior is, and not all behaviors can become automatic. You know, for example, it might be impossible to have you walk through preparation of your 1040 in a sleep light state where you can sort of you know, calculate your W2s and all of your deductions automatically from start to finish. But for other less complicated behaviors, it might be easier. And so we want to kind of think about what are some criteria that might create that differential. And so with that in mind, we created the easy checklist where behaviors that meet these criteria might be better candidates for behavioral change. And it stands for embedded behavior, that the behavior is always occurring, that there's action that is seamless, uh, and that this behavior is yoked or tied to uh, uh, very strongly to a particular reward. So let's start with this first idea of embeddedness. When we think about behavioral embedding, we need to consider that behavior doesn't occur in a vacuum, but instead happens within a particular context. And in order to create a habit, you need to determine whether or not you can fit the behavior into a key consumption context, or whether or not you actually might need to create or suggest a new consumption context where the behavior might fit in more appropriately. For example, a simple goal of like an oral care company might be to get people to use a breath strip you know, before they, just in general. Um, but putting into context helps you make more sense of what the customer's cues and more importantly, what they're learning the behavior, their rewards might be. So we might want to say like, hey, I want to get someone to use a breath strip before they enter a bar every time. And there I have a much better idea of what the kind of internal mental cues as well as the external cues are. And I have a better idea of what sort of rewards or benefits of the product people might be looking for. One more example, uh, let's say I was trying to create a habit around feeding wet dog food, uh, for dogs of course, not for people. Um, here because people kind of look at this product uh, often as a treat for their dogs or as an indulgence and they kind of do it a little bit more infrequently, 
you might want to create a more unique context for usage. And so you might want to say, you know, I'm going to make this wet dog food part of my family meal, right? So before Tony Soprano feeds the rest of his gang uh, the Sunday gravy, you know, they open the can of Caesar and they feed that to uh, the dogs at the Bada Bing Club. So again, the whole idea here is that understanding the context gives you an idea of which behaviors might be relevant and whether or not that behavior really fits into the overall kind of picture of what your customer is trying to do in those cases. Now the A is a simple one. Uh, the A in the checklist stands for always. And this really just refers to the fact that habits take time. Uh, you know, there have been some kind of people who have talked about it. it takes 21 days to make a habit. It takes 28 days to make the habit. It really depends. The key to any habit, though, is repetition. And like we know, you know it will take fewer cigarettes to get you addicted than it will trips to the gym to get you addicted to going to the gym, right? So it really depends, again, on that link between what is the behavior, what are the rewards that you get, and how does that fit into kind of the overall context. But again, that key factor being that it's always repeated. The S in the EASY framework stands for seamless. And when we think about seamlessness, it's really about how difficult it might be for your consumers to perform the behavior. And one kind of analogy that I like to give here is about the learning curve of innovations, right? And so, you know, some behaviors don't require any new consumer learning in order for them to successfully use the product. And so here, if I wanted to try to get orange juice drinkers to create a habit of drinking calcium orange juice, uh, that might not be too difficult. Right? They don't really have to learn anything new about the way that they consume the product in order to use it effectively. Sort of somewhere in the middle might be an update to your new operating system on your phone. Right there, there might be some fluid behaviors that transfer over. Uh, but there might be a little bit more barriers or headway in terms of doing things like you did before if things have changed or the kind of flow of using the product has differed. And then finally, there might be some behaviors that are wholly new to the consumer. And you can think about something which is really kind of dis disruptive like voice technology or voice control, uh, which might require a lot of new learning at first and changes in behavior for the person to really make it sticky. And these might, become, might actually be the hardest uh, to create into behaviors quickly. It's not to say that's impossible, uh, but it just might be a little bit more difficult to occur in a rapid fashion. So the final area of the easy framework is linked to rewards. And any behavior that we want people to do really has to be rewarded. Uh, they're really a critical component of habitual development uh, during these initial stages because they're what cause us to repeat the behavior again and again, even before it becomes automatic. And you know, we can sort of think about the different categories of rewards. We'll talk about rewards again in a second, but these can be kind of sensory, they can be social rewards that we have uh, that help us kind of establish our identity. There might be emotional aspects like love or camaraderie or just happiness and content. Uh, there might be cognitive benefits like learning something new or different that you hadn't known before which empowers you to do more. Or it might be simply about just saving time, right? And we see a lot of products that are developed right around that. Now, when we think about these rewards though, just like how behaviors can sort of be looked at on a gradient or a continuum from easy to hard, we can also think about which rewards might be the most effective. And when we think about these rewards, you know, we want to consider rewards that are repeated over and over again, and that all of these rewards kind of fit together. And so the first step that you can take, and so these are, can all work together in the zero framework, or you can sort of attack one that best fits what your product does. But obviously, the more that you do, uh, the more rapid habitual adoption will be. So this first area is on hedonic rewards. And these hedonic sensory rewards really speak to system one. And that's because system one is very much a sensory perceptual part of our information processing. It almost acts as kind of the direct filter for what's coming into our mind. And then it can flag or system two can jump in and then say, hey, I need to pay attention to this, or it can just ignore it. Um, but it speaks in this language of sensation. And so for a consumable, these would relate to product and packaging experiences, right? So like smell, the flavor, the feel of the product, the different sounds that it might make uh, for you. And for services, this relates much more to the atmospherics. Or for a technology product, it would relate to the user experience. Uh, or for other encounters, it might just be about that kind of overall experience itself. 
And so you, know, you can think about, if you were a retailer, about what the tangibles of your service are. You know, does it smell good? Does it look nice? How does it feel? How are things presented? What should it sound like? Right? And all of these things can be incorporated together to really create some strong System 1 sensory rewards for your consumers. You can also offer expanded rewards by speaking to individuals' emotional or social concerns. And so emotions are interesting because they operate at both the System 1 and System 2 level. And so looking at this Dove example here, right, this is a post-consumption reward that we have after eating one of the small Dove's Promises chocolates. But it makes you feel good. You know, it's that sort of emotional benefit that you get. And if you think about why people might be reaching for that bag of chocolates, right, it's either maybe they're celebrating, maybe they want that extra amount of comfort out there. But these sort of messages that Dove is giving really fits into that emotional need which might be drawing people to the candy bag in the first place, right? And so the question is, you know, what sort of post-consumption experiences can you use to create this emotional driver for your customers? And there's also a lot of evidence from behavioral science that shows the benefit of pro-social behavior. In fact, uh, one of the MSI academic trustees and the, who did a recent webinar, Mike Norton from Harvard, uh, he's done a bunch of work which actually shows that spending on others is more rewarding uh, than spending on ourselves. And so we've seen social, pro-social rewards like this underpin a lot of recent brands like Tom Shoes or Ethos Water, Warby Parker, or the sock company Bombas. And so the next R in uh, Be a Hero is for repeated. And so if you've ever played a slot machine before, you know how good it feels when you win, right? And obviously we'd all love to play at a casino uh, where we won on each and every pull of the machine. And you know, as a casino operator, probably not a great strategy for you to do this. But as a marketer or a product designer, right, you can and probably should be doing this. The functional, emotional, the social rewards of a product should be seen or felt or emphasized as often as possible to the consumer. And that helps create that initial buy-in for the repeated behavior. And you know, they often say in kind of both neuroscience and psychology, you know, neurons that wire together fire together. And really it's kind of this repetition that causes this to happen over the long term, right? So this is what's training system one to pick up on what that cue is, what behavior should be responded, and what reward should be anticipated later on. And so finally and relatedly, you need to offer the expected and desired product benefits that are there, right? I mean, what makes a great pastry is a very different set of benefits than what might make a great financial advisor or accountant. And what's interesting is when you offer this desired benefit or when you talk about this desired benefit to your consumers, you can go do so in a very overt and conscious way. You can also do this in a non-conscious way as well. So kind of looking at the conscious example, you know, we can think about Campbell's Soup. And one of the things that they've done very often is emphasize you know, their product being something that warms you up on a cold day. It's this immediate connection to the past, to your childhood, and always centered around the idea of comfort being very obvious in what it's saying there. Now, there are ways that we can do this non-consciously as well. And so here we would sort of explicitly or metaphorically link a product to unarticulated needs, right? And so here, you know, the example for candies fragrances is probably not as non-conscious as they thought it might be, but clearly using metaphors around you know, sex and sexual imagery to imply the benefits that that product consumption will bring to you. On the right, we see a kind of jokey uh, BMW ad, you know, my bonus is bigger than your bonus, really speaking to what that unarticulated need or unarticulated reward might be that the consumer has been looking for. So once the link between these behaviors and rewards are kind of you know, established, we can start to think about how we want to trigger these behaviors. And this really gets back to the idea that we spoke about before. You know, what is it that is going to cause these actions to happen? What are the things that are going to tell system one, please jump into action? You know, please start doing something. Do what we've always done before. It works for us. And there's a lot of different sorts of cues uh, that we can have. So you know, some of them might be conscious. I might, I'd like to have a sandwich for today. You know, and, and I can go out and I can do that. Others might be more non-conscious or system one in nature. So you know, internally we might be triggered by changes in our identity, right? So the sorts of actions I might think about when I'm with my family 
might be very different than the actions I take when I'm with my friends or with my coworkers. You know, internally we all have these scripts. So, you know, as we finish a meal, we might want a dessert, or we might automatically think about ordering a cup of coffee. Or in the old days, we might have gone out to have a cigar. I guess people go out and have their, you know, jewel or vaporizer now. Now there are other psychological states as well. So if we feel bored inside, or if we feel frustrated, that might serve as a cue for a particular action. Our physical locations might serve as a cue for action as well. So you know, when I leave my house in the morning and I show up at work after getting off the subway, right, there's a whole new set of actions that I start thinking about. And then finally, there are these visceral states, right? So if I'm hungry or I'm tired or I'm lonely or I'm bored, you know, these can drive us to act as well. So the interesting thing is, again, you know, like many things, these cues have differential eff efficacy. And you know, both academic findings and our own work have at least painted a roadmap towards creating more impactful cues. And what we found is that triggers that are concrete, unique, embedded, or salient are really the most powerful. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these now. So I think the first is really the most simple, and it's about making the cue concrete. And this really relates to physicality. Are there ways of taking an idea or a mental thought and putting it into physical form? And psychology has shown that we react much more strongly to concrete items than to abstract ones. And again, this is the result of system one's focus on the here and now, what's in front of us, what's in our world rather than what's in our head. And here's some nice examples. So uh, in New York City here, uh, they always say, you know, stand away from the doors and let the people off the subway before you board. As we can see in that example of the left, it gives you a strong way of putting that message into a physical form uh, that people can see and then respond to. Right? There's the old adage, if you want to remember something, tie a string on your finger. It's kind of a, a low-tech example of that concreteness. Uh, if you've been in a men's restroom lately, you might see the fly on one of the urinals, which shows you kind of very concretely where to aim in order to minimize your splashback. And of course, there's the ubiquitous physical buzzes and taps that we get from our phones or our watches or other devices that we might have. Now the next factor is uniqueness. And what's interesting is that our memories and system one are an association machine that really you know, relies on this kind of net of associations of items that are all related to one another. And one of the interesting properties of the system is that when there are more links from a cue to an item, each of these cue strength is actually diminished a little bit more than when there is one distinct cue or symbol related to the behavior or the desired action. And so when you're thinking about what cue you want to have for a particular behavior, consider what unique cues can I make. And I think you know the stop sign's a great example of this, right? When you see it, there's only one thing to do. Of course, unless you're from South Florida where I am, where it's sort of treated like a, a yellow light. And of course, when we see you know, wine glasses, you know, the different shape of those glasses signify us almost immediately, you know, what should we put in them? So when we see that fat goblet, we want red wine. When we see the skinny one, we know that it's a champagne flute. Now, cues can also, like behaviors, be embedded. And what we've seen is that behaviors that are embedded or part of the current routine are especially powerful. And so when you think about it, you know, creating a behavior, are there current routines that the consumer has that you can sort of sneak your behavior into. Like, so thinking about you know, the bar or the Sunday night dinner examples from before, right, where exactly would that behavior take place within those experiences? What's coming right before? What's coming right afterwards? Right? Because you have uh, multiple opportunities for queuing within that routine right before, and you have multiple opportunities afterwards. And it's interesting because both consciously and unconsciously, we like to complete things. We have this innate need for closure which has been called the kind of Zagarnik effect, which is really the cliffhanger effect. You want to make sure things end properly. And we've seen a lot of companies utilize this. So there's the classic Febreze example, which is sort of taking the product as the reward and then embedding it into the behavior of cleaning. We've seen this with a lot of oral care products as well, where do they fit into the, the oral care or oral hygiene process. And I think interestingly are these examples on the right, which are really kind of creating perceptions of embeddedness using packaging clues. So looking at herbal essences, right, those two bottles fit together. So the shampoo and the conditioner, you sort of know, go together. On the right, you have the classic clinic system of step one, step two, step three. Right? And then again, let's you know that I have to go in this order. And if people skip step two, they're automatically reminded of that when they see three. Oh, well, I only did one. And uh, now I'm at three, I, I better go back and find the clarifying motion, which is number two. 
So the final thing that makes a queue powerful is how salient it is. And salient just means that the queue grabs attention and really just can't be missed by system one or system two. So as I mentioned before, I was you know, originally born uh, in, in Florida. Uh, and if you're from the South, you recognize the appeal of the Krispy Kreme donut sign almost immediately. Uh, and I know that when I'm driving down there and I see this sign illuminated, like my hands automatically turn that car into the parking lot when I see it. Right? And of course, like we have the you know, example of phone notifications. And I think another wonderful example is from Copenhagen where the city planning and sanitation teams work together to create green steps on the pavement in high traffic areas that would trigger people to A, kind of think about being eco-consciousness in the first place, and then B, those steps would lead to the trash. So kind of really grabbing their attention and then making the behavior as seamless as possible for them. So you can start to see how these things really work together in order to drive a behavior over time. So now that we've learned kind of what habits are and how to create or at least the elements of the ecosystem that can support them, it's useful to consider when these habits can be made or broken. And in order to do that, let's go back to uh, the movie theater example. So again, you remember people who got the fresh popcorn and the stale popcorn both ate the same amount. But Dr. Wood and her colleagues also looked at two other factors. The first thing they did is, what happened if people had to eat with their non-dominant hands, right? And it happened if you were a righty and you were forced to eat with your left hand, or if you were a lefty and forced to eat with your right hand, you didn't eat as much. And if you got the stale popcorn, you just stopped eating. And again, this shows that kind of a small change in the context of that behavior can have a large disruption in the performance of that behavior. The other thing they did is they waited a week later and they performed this experiment in the same exact way, but instead of going to the movie theater, they went to the campus rec room. And there, in that new setting for frequent movie theater goers, they did not experience the same habitual effect. The people that got the stale popcorn didn't eat as much as the people who got the fresh popcorn did. And so what this really shows us is it's about disruption or disruptive moments in people's lives. Where are they shaken out of their mental or physical locations where the cues that they typically rely upon are either no longer present or they're no longer relevant? And we won't go into all of these today, but this gives you a taste of these times that matter. So we can think about kind of large calendar changes. Uh, so there's been some work done uh, on the fresh start effect, right? So you always see more people at the gym on December 3rd than you do, uh, I mean, on January 3rd than you do on December 28th, right? Birthdays, anniversaries, all of these times really kind of create a unique opportunity uh, for people to reevaluate their own behaviors, right? We see, again, you know, if your identity changes in a real way, you know, or if your mindset changes in a significant way, this can also be really disruptive as to the current cues that are effective for you. Obviously, if you have emergent needs, right, so when gas prices increase dramatically, everyone starts to reconsider if they want to have a, you know, classic combustion uh, vehicle versus something more electric or a hybrid. And then finally, these changes in physical location or setting, right? So when we go on vacation, you know, one of the things I like to do always is, you know, go to the grocery store. And there, you know, I can't just go and pick up the brands that I normally go. I can't just go to aisle eight, which I normally do during my shopping adventure. Those cues are no longer present and I'm forced into a place where I have to use system two to start reevaluating new behaviors, what those rewards might be for them, and whether or not those rewards are relevant to me or not. And this final point about relevancy, I think raises a great point, and that is, you know, if we think about what matters, these disruptive moments matter, but they have to align with the goals that people have over a particular point in time. You know, for example, it might be super disruptive in my life if my house burns down and I have to consider, you know, where to live and where to, you know, keep my family safe, I'm not going to start considering things like how to change my hair care routine at that moment. Now that said, I could be open to habits changes in other areas, though, if they were related to safety or well-being or fire protection, right? It makes sense that kind of with these disruptive moments, there's typically a goal that's involved. And in order to kind of break through the consumers to get them to start working on developing a habit, the benefit of your product needs to align with those goals. And I like to show this slide. This is from Ad Age magazine. Uh, but it gives you a sense of kind of how different products target different moments in you know, a consumer's journey from high school all the way through college graduation. But it makes sense. You know, when you get into college, 
your goal, you know, it's disruptive, and your goal is I want to hold on to these memories that I have right now. So you take a lot of pictures. When you move out, you know, you have that emergent need of having to get that bed sheet that doesn't fit on anything else but a dorm bed. So you go to Bed Bath and Beyond to get it. And I love the one of going into a fraternity, right? So there, you know, the obvious goal is fitting in. So you know, Sperry top type sliders, uh, you know, vineyard vines pants, you know, anything that will help you fit in with like the Brads and the Chads of the world. You know, these are going to be the things that are really kind of impactful during those sorts of disruptive moments. So I'm hoping by this point, you know, I've shown you the power of habits and, and how to create them. And you know, that said, the framework that we've developed really requires you to know things in order to act. And so I'd like to share with you the way that we at Ipsos consider what should you be knowing, what, what do you need to know uh, in order to develop this plan, and, and how might you think about kind of developing that research program going forward in the best way. And like many things in behavioral science, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to anything. But these are some general principles and techniques, and ones that we found particularly useful uh, and somewhat easy to adapt to the various contexts that all of our clients uh, uh, operate in. So one of the first things that we think about is who is the target of behavioral change? What consumer's behavior are we trying to change? And this lets us know, again, you know, what sorts of rewards they might be looking for, what sort of context might they be operating in, what sort of behaviors are they currently doing right now. And from there, we dive a little bit deeper into that context. What are the things that are kind of wrapped around or envelop the behavior itself that we're looking at? And then from there, we sort of double click in on what are those cues? What are the things that are happening immediately prior to product purchase or consumption or service use? Uh, and really kind of see, you know, what are the conscious factors there? What are some things that are repeatedly occurring that the consumer might not be uh, aware of, but it might still be impacting their behavior? And finally, what are the kind of immediate rewards that are there? And what might be some delayed rewards that people have? And are they system one rewards or system two rewards? And then finally, we could start to consider when are these opportunities for disruption in their lives? So we can kind of do a deeper analysis of when are the moments that matter to them, and when is there some kind of shakeup around those moments that are related to the goal. And one of the ways that we've looked at this, and I'll just kind of briefly show you this, is you know, we believe strongly in a multi or mixed methods approach to investigating this. And so as the Behavioral Science Center kind of in, encounters any of these, we really like to have a strong understanding of what you know already. Um, and so we like to see kind of what your goals are, what the business strategy is, and kind of what you've done before, what's been successful, what's not, what have you tried. And from there, that really helps us kind of create exactly what we're looking for as we begin to listen to consumers. So this example has some kind of uh, social intelligence or, or online listening. Uh, we've also used pop-up communities or in-depth interviews in that second stage. And then finally, we really think it's important to watch because it's not only important to understand what consumers are saying, but it's important to understand what they're doing and the context that they're doing that in. So we're strong believers at the Behavioral Science Center of the power of ethnography, of immersion, and of observation. And so those three components together really help us form the understanding. And then from there, we work with our clients to really just help them kind of, what do I do with this? You know, what have we learned? What does it mean for me? And then how can I do things? So we sort of review these insights and then plan some next steps for activation with them. And then of course, you know, behavioral science, if you've ever tried to implement these ideas in your organization, are, are sometimes difficult because it depends is an answer that we often get. And so we often stick around to just help people kind of think about these issues for a number of weeks afterwards uh, to, to assist with activation and implementation. So you've been really patient with me so far, and I, I know that we've covered a lot, but I did just want to leave you with three key takeaways before we move into the question and answer. And I think the first is that habits research and activation is not only about usage or sticky usage or increased usage. It can also be used to inform a number of different marketing activities. The second main point is that there's no one solve for a habit. You can't just make one cue or add one new reward without considering the, the context or the person or the behavior. In order to tackle habits effectively, you need to create an integrated ecosystem of both smaller and larger marketing actions. And then the final point is that habits occur in a context. And in order to kind of work with habits, 
you really need to have a good amount of knowledge before you begin with solution building. Uh, jumping into action too soon uh, can lead you in the wrong direction, or it might just lead you towards solutions that are not appropriate for your brand, or more importantly, relevant to your consumers. So I, I do see that there are some questions on time. Uh, uh, if we have a few minutes, I'd love to take a couple, Earl. Uh, yeah, that's great, Jesse. Thanks a lot. That was uh, very thorough and very interesting. Uh, I really like the way you've organized the key points in terms of those mnemonic devices, the words that we can remember. Um, I want to remind the audience uh, that they can send questions directly through the chat with the presenter function on the left-hand corner of the screen, and we do have a few minutes uh, to ask Jesse some additional questions. Uh, let me uh, start with a couple that have already come in, though. Um, Santa Katrina has a question about uh, do rewards change over time? And the example that she mentioned, I think, would be like when you sign up to go to a gym. You may have some kind of motivation or reward initially, and that may be a moving target over time. Uh, we've actually had some interesting presentations from academics who have studied just that, how, how the uh, sense of the reward varies as we approach the goal that we're seeking. Uh, so maybe just a, a few comments reflecting from your experience about that phenomenon. Oh, it's a great question. It's, it's you know, again, one that we've seen a bunch of times here on our side as well. And I think what's interesting about this is kind of twofold. I mean, short answer, uh, yes. The nature of the reward does change over time, right? And there are multiple psychological factors that contribute to that. You know, A, we see kind of satiation and habituation, right? So you, know, you can almost think of it as like a tolerance. What was good yesterday becomes our new reference point. And so we think about how do I benefit more from the next time that I go going forward. And the length of that habituation process, the length of that desensitization, the length of that tolerance buildup changes based on the nature of what those different rewards are. Right? You can think about some of them where, you know, if we think about going back to something like, you know, smoking cigarettes or other sorts of drugs or alcohol, that reward is immediate, it occurs every time. Now it's not that the sensation or desire for that reward changes, but the magnitude or you know, amount of physical stimulus necessary to achieve that reward changes. Now going to the gym is a very interesting one because there, when you start going to the gym, you have both positive rewards and you have negative consequences, right? So you know, it's January 2nd, you know, I've made a commitment to not eat as many chicken McNuggets in 2019 and I'm gonna hit the gym. So I go there and I work out really, really hard. And so two things happen. One is I feel super good about myself for following through on what I've done, right? Presumably there's some sort of physiological endorphin rush that happens right afterwards, but then something else happens. I'm really sore or I don't feel well or I feel like a failure compared to other people at the gym, right? And what happens over time with going to the gym as an example is that those system one rewards, those physiological rewards, that feeling good after I work out, that feeling of pride maintained, but those negative consequences disappear, right? So it's very interesting to think about the way that those two things can work together, especially if we think about what are the negative consequences of initiating a new behavior? What are the rewards that are received? Now, the final point that I'll make on this, and again, you'll know that I'm a former professor, because I can talk, uh, is that it's sometimes okay with a habit if the reward disappears over time. And thinking back to the movie theater example, right, once that key behavior link becomes so strongly established, if there are moments where the product fails on delivering that reward or the service experience is not the same as it used to be, our system one is not reorganizing itself so quickly in order to change that belief going forward. So it really does take a number of reward failures or kind of negative reward experiences to deactivate that key behavior link. That's great, Jesse, thanks. Um, Maribel had a question early on about um, the role of habits in adopting technology, uh, social media usage. I think some of your examples sort of touched on that. Uh, I suppose the, the question here could be um, the well-known phenomenon of people being a little uh, averse to a new technological development in, in, until uh, you know, the consumer benefits become uh, clear or perhaps the use is easier. So I presume you've had some experience over the years working with people on uh, technology adoption and usage. Maybe just reflect a little bit on the role of habit in helping you uh, get over that kind of a hurdle. No, it's, it's a great question. And again, you know, one that we've seen multiple times in multiple formats, you know, how do we get people to transition from some brick and mortar behavior that they've been doing into something more digital, right? Whether it's ordering groceries, depositing a check, 
um, watching a movie even, right? And what's been interesting there, and I have to admit my bias, is like my intuition was just like, these are just old people, let's just wait, and the problem fixes itself. And it's not the case at all. And I think one of the most insightful things there is really gaining an understanding of what constitutes a positive and negative reward for the different segments that you're trying to target. So for some, one example that, that I can give is uh, we were working with a, a, a large financial institution on um, how do I get people to use the digital app, right? And of course, they're like, oh, well, it's so easy, and it saves you all of this time, and they're very much focused on that. But at the end of the day, the people who were not adopting had significant concerns about you know, security. And security meant a lot of different things, right? It was getting hacked. It was the inability to do something, or what happens if it messes up in the middle, right? And so getting an understanding of what those barriers are or what the negative and positive rewards are that people are seeking are sometimes not as obvious. And so getting that understanding specific to the context that you're operating in with your digital system uh, I think is a really important first step towards helping design the program to get people to transition over and then use that new product uh, in a habitual manner. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Anik had asked a related question about how to get people to replace a given product with a new habit or product, and I think uh, they could extrapolate probably from your comments just now. So I do want to move on to uh, a question that Aaron raised about whether and how uh, habits and the impact of habits on customer behavior and so forth might change with cross-cultural uh, differences or even within uh, uh, ethnic groups within a given uh, society. So uh, maybe a little bit of the cross-cultural or, or multi-ethnic perspective on some of the things you've shared. No, it's a, it's a great question and, and again reflective of the exact sorts of things we're hearing from a lot of uh, different clients. And so again, it really relates back to what is the behavior kind of, how does that context change of where that behavior can occur uh, across these different cultures? And then in terms of the rewards, right? These immediate system one rewards that people get, you know, does it feel good, does it taste good, does it look good, does it sound good? These are universal human elements, right? So that's gonna cut across cultural divides. We're all humans, we all respond to the same way there in you know, the same way that the lab rat does. Where it becomes interesting is twofold. One, what are the different rewards that people seek in meaning to their own lives, right? And so different cultures have different things that they value as important or not. And so, you know, we can go all the way back to something like Hoxie's cultural dimensions and think about, you know, some countries have a larger power dynamic, you know, gender equality, uh, we can think about the autonomy of the individual versus the group, right? All of these things impact what rewards people might be focused on, what they think is important, and kind of how those play out, you know, operationally for a given product as well. And I think that understanding both those differences as well as the different contexts that behaviors are occurring are really kind of the key link there. You know, those easy system one rewards are there. Once you figure out what that context is, those cues are going to pop out in the same way that they would in any other culture. But it's really kind of knowing what to look at on the back end with behavior and uh, with rewards and then looking at the context with behavior. That's a great answer. And I think it illustrates the point you made throughout about the power and the importance of context, uh, cultural norms being one of those types of context. Uh, one of our academics uh, at uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Jeff Emman, asked the question, uh, is breaking the habit that consumers have for a given product sort of the opposite of making the, the habits that you would want to get people to start and uh, adopt your products? So in other words, a lot of marketing is probably about getting people to switch and breaking the habit that uh, they use to currently make a decision about the purchase uh, you know, of a, of a CPG product or something they purchase routinely. So. Um, would you describe the, the breaking habit as sort of the inverse of the making the habits, or are there, are there particular uh, angles there that, that might be a little different? No, it's a, thanks for a great question, Jeff. Um, I think it's a really good question. And you know, normally when we think about creating these habits, it is at the category level. How do I drive kind of category use of the product being the essential component of habitual behavior? 
when we look at brand behavior, right, one of the major awards that brand serves is just around this goal of efficiency, right? When I go to the toothpaste aisle, I don't have to sample press and then toothpaste and then Mentadent and then Colgate in order to understand which one's going to serve me best, right? I just go and I bought the one that I did before. I buy the brand that's appealing to me. And so there, it really centers around, like, what is the role of the brand? And is the brand able to offer any sort of reward that is significantly differentiated than the other rewards that are offered by the category at whole? And then are there ways to create kind of brand-specific cues for that reward outside of the distinctive assets that the brand has? And, and I don't know that that's a question that we've necessarily cracked yet. I think that most of the areas where we've seen the greatest effect have been with driving category usage. Uh, we've done less work on brand switching in that area, presumably because it's a much harder task for people to do, right? It's like that difference in toothpaste is very difficult for people to pick up on perceptually. Um, and then to explain it to them is very system two in nature and is not as effective going forward. But I, I think it's an important question, um, and I think that one that as our tools and methodologies develop, we'll be answer, able to answer uh, hopefully uh, more concretely. I think that's a very good and frank response to that question because I would agree. I think it's a much harder challenge to understand more of the conscious decision making. And I actually want to piggyback on Jeff's question and push on that a little bit. The prevailing assumption here, and I think it's probably right, is that habitual behavior, these habits of making a purchase and even purchasing a specific brand is a good thing for the brand. But I'm wondering, is there a kind of a tipping point where just unreflectively picking the same brand time after time makes that customer vulnerable to an appeal from another brand where they give them more of a reason to believe or persuasive uh, uh, point? Uh, you know, uh, if it's habitual, I haven't thought about why I'm doing this in a long time, I may not be able to sort of fend off that appeal to me to think about it differently and change and reframe the question. So I'm wondering, is it like a lot of things in life that can have too much of a good thing? Maybe uh, in some cases being too habitual is actually could be a detriment to the brand and it needs to sort of remind the consumer why they are purchasing the brand from time to time. No, it's a, that's a fantastic question. I like the way that you rephrase that for me, Earl. And so, you know, I'll give a, a personal anecdote and, you know, to help answer the question. So I, uh, for a while, did a lot of exercise and, like, mini triathlons and stuff. So I burned through tons of tennis shoes, right? And I was a loyal buyer of one particular athletic company shoes for a very long time. I didn't even try on other shoes. And there it was kind of some real product-related failures, right? And so there – having a significant product failure or the inability of a product to actually deliver a benefit going forward causes you to reevaluate, right? So it's like the third time the tread came off my sneakers, I'm like, I'm not going to buy this brand anymore, right? I'm going to investigate who makes the best sneakers that can handle, you know, the sort of, you know, workouts that I'm doing. Um, and so there, you know, it's kind of looking at, what might it, how often does that kind of lack of reward need to occur in order for somebody to kind of view that as a disruption or to have a new emergent need as their disruptive moment, right? And again, it really depends on the individual. Like how important is it to that person? You know, how significant uh, of a purchase is it? You know, how involved are they in the product category to begin with? Right? And these things sort of work together to kind of say, you know, for ones that I'm really involved with and that are really central to my identity and who I believe I am, right, the amount of failure that I might tolerate there is going to be significantly less than for something that might not have as big of an impact on me. Now, that said, if the product failure re is related to something that might be threatening to my health or if it's a real system one, you know, product failure, you know, that might cause me to look at things more quickly as well, right? So there's a classic example of, like, finding the fried mouse in your fried chicken that you ordered, right? Like, that might cause you to reevaluate relatively quickly. Um, or it might be something like, you know, a medical recall, right? So we found out that a medication might be actually harmful there. And so that's directly threatening to me. System 1 and System 2 are going to respond to that very quickly. And so the amount of kind of, product failure that's required, again, would be much lower than for something like toothpaste or, you know, a bad glass of orange juice or bad service at a restaurant where I'm a regular. 
Great. I, I want to add a, I think it's a related question that occurred to me earlier. Um, several of the examples you gave, and one of your slides actually had a picture of the mouse, you know, we'll press lever for food or whatever. And I'm sure that reminds a lot of us of uh, Skinner's classic experiments about uh, the role of reinforcement in learning. And uh, as I recall, it was the irregular pattern of rewards that actually reinforced the learning the most. So at a couple of points, you would stress the importance of having the repetitive, you know, predictable uh, uh, rewards there. And I'm wondering if there isn't maybe, again, along the lines you were just sharing, a role for sort of the serendipity of the reward or the unpredicted nature that maybe refreshes the, the connections between the activity and, and uh, the goal that the person is pursuing. So just a thought about whether, it, again, maybe it's possible to be a little too regular, a little too habitual in our marketing or rewards for our consumers, and maybe what they also are seeking occasionally is, is a sense of newness or a serendipity. No, it's a, another fantastic question, right? And if we go back to the slot machine example, right, yes, it's great to win, but it's that question of will I win, which is what caused you to pull the lever each and every time, right, that there's some sort of like variable ratio in the number of pulls that you need to do in order to get a reward. And so again, there's two aspects to this. So while you're definitely right on that first aspect, right, having that differential timing matters sometimes. What's interesting about products is that the outcome that people are experiencing might be different there. And so you have variety in the reward type versus the reward frequency. Right? And products are multidimensional. And when we consume them, there are often different types of the product that might become salient or relevant to us at a particular point in time. And so the goal here is, again, like I don't want to just have a product that only tastes good. Right? I want it to taste good and smell good and look good. Right? I also want to have some emotional connection or maybe some pro-social. And so having this mix of rewards that people can experience built into the product or service then allows people in kind of that inconsistent way pick up on different aspects of what the reward might be. So the key thing is that the product is always linked to some reward, but what reward people are attending to can differ based on their consumption experience. That's great. That's a, a great, I think, practical note to end on because it does really suggest, I think, our audience uh, ways they can begin to apply these insights and ask themselves exactly those questions. Is our product or offer providing these types of multiple uh, rewards for consumers at different points in their uh, decision cycle and the experience of the product or the service? So again, I want to thank Jesse for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, several of you are asking, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar soon. Those of you who are MSI corporate sponsors, members will also have access to the slide deck. Um, if you have additional questions uh, for Jesse, you can reach him at the email address that's uh, shown on the screen, jesse.itskowitz at ipsos.com. Uh, and I want to remind the audience that since 1961, nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing's biggest challenges. So thanks again to Jesse and to our audience today, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next Lunch and Learn webinar.